You are a hunter. You belong to a family of hunters. Like every single human being who has come before you, you hunt. Now, you may not be the sort of hunter who lies and wait for its next meal, or the sort of hunter who crosses the savanna following their prey, but you still hunt. I've actually seen you hunting. Now, I've seen you at the supermarket, the Migro, or the co-op, carefully selecting your prey, mapping your best approach, silently stalking your victim, and making a kill. You will forever be a hunter. Now, when did you and I and all humans start hunting? Well, to answer this, we have to understand this. This is a diagram showing every geologic era that has passed since the Earth was formed four and a half billion years ago. Yeah, I think it's a bit complicated too. So, let me summarize, all right? Life appeared, life diversified, some things died, other things survived, and the things that survived started eating each other. So this went on for about 4.499 billion years or so. Then, about a million years ago, this awkward hirsute uh, bipedal mammals showed up. That was us. At first, our human ancestors were one of just a uh, myriad creatures that were fighting for survival in the wild. Most other animals didn't even notice our arrival. I mean, we weren't especially large, we weren't exceptionally strong, and we certainly weren't very interesting. But once we figured out a few clever tricks, all of that changed. Early humans banded together to hunt, and they learned how to take down prey that was larger than themselves. And this is something that very few predators can do. It requires coordination, communication, planning, and if you're really being creative, tools. Now, in the beginning, when the Earth was less crowded, our hunting habits didn't have much of an impact beyond our immediate surroundings. We could use up prey in an area and then move on. But as we came better, became better hunters, we used the tricks that we had learned to spread into every habitat on the planet. Suddenly, we became hunters that were much more successful. Now, over time, we developed more tools. More tools led to better hunting, Better hunting meant more food, more food meant more people, more people meant more demand. More demand meant more hunting. And suddenly, we had much greater impacts on our prey. Eventually, we were hunting everything, everywhere. Now, as our influence grew, there was less and less wild space for prey. So we captured our prey and we changed it. We started to manage our prey and some of it was domesticated. But through all of this, most humans were still hunting. But today, now that most of us live in the tightly packed urban jungle, we've been first forced to hunt differently. Food that once came from prey living in the same place, same wild place that we called home, now comes wrapped in plastic. But even after all of this, there is still one place where humans still hunt for a huge amount of food. Hunting in this place, I'm going to hunt this mosquito. <laughs> hunting in this place, the ocean, is the only true link we share with our wild hunter past. Seafood is the last wild food. My name's Thomas and I'm an urban hunter who has a love affair with the ocean. As a marine biologist, an environmentalist, and an educator, I work to protect the hunters and the last wild food. Like many of you, I grew up far from the ocean. My Swiss father, who immigrated to Canada, was a hunter. When I was a child, I would beg him to not go and kill the cute, cuddly animals. Uh, one time when I was eight, my father, ever the humorist, told me he had brought me a gift. So I excitedly ran downstairs and I tore open the black plastic garbage bag to reveal a severed deer head inside. 
with its like black, lifeless eyes staring back at me. So I turned vegetarian for a while <laughs> shortly thereafter. Thanks, Bob. Um, but I eventually learned that even the most innocent among us are hunters. We have simply outsourced our hunting. So if you've ever eaten a banana, grilled a bratwurst, or sipped an espresso, you have outsourced your hunting. So most of us have never seen our prey alive, nor do we like to think about it. But someone, somewhere, has had to hunt for your dinner. Now, every good hunter also knows that they will need prey tomorrow. And so they make smart decisions today to make sure that this happens. And you do this every time that you read a label, you look at a list of ingredients, or you choose something to buy at a store. So perhaps surprisingly, we guide, or we urban hunters, we guide our collective hunting strategy by making informed decisions about the food that we buy. And those decisions, the effects of your choices, are passed down the supply chain uh, to the hunter, the gatherer, or the collector. Today, there are half a billion people who are directly supported by the fish and seafood that we all buy. Even though we in Europe uh, see more cows than whales on a daily basis, our wild prey can come from much further away. Yellowfin tuna, for example, uh, is flown in three times a week fresh uh, from where it's caught by hand from places near the equator. Not only has the way that we distribute our seafood changed, but the way that we hunt fish has been changed drastically. By finding better ways to fish and upscaling our hunting strategies, we have become much more effective hunters. The impacts that we've had on our prey have also changed. But the fundamental responsibility for the hunter is the same. So responsible hunting is the only way that we can guarantee the continued existence of the last wild food. So what exactly does responsible modern-day fishing look like? Well, let me take you on a journey. Let's go visit an archipelago of coral atolls in the middle of the Indian Ocean. The people of the Maldives have been fishing for tuna since they arrived on the islands hundreds of years ago. Today, the pole and line fishing method is considered one of the simplest and most effective ways to hunt wild tuna. This is a doni, so basically a, a mechanized fishing platform. Now, uh, the guys, guys fishing in the Maldives, the guys head out every evening and they anchor near a coral reef. And then they take these lights and they put them over the side of the boat and they wait. And at about three or four in the morning, everyone wakes up and they take a huge net, attach the big long bamboo poles, they scoop the net into the water and they take out all the little fish that have been attracted to the lights. They take all these fish and they put them into the hold and then they head out to the open ocean. At sunrise, they look for, uh, they look for signs of activity at the surface of the water. So either birds flying around or dolphins, and that is an indication of there being fish below. So they move out to where the fish are, and all the guys line up at the back of the boat. Each one takes a bamboo fishing rod attached, rod attached to a line, attached to one hook. Now these hooks are not barbed, they're just a simple hook with a little uh, lure on them. Then one guy grabs handfuls of the fish they had caught earlier and throws them into the water. And this is what happens. So this is one person, one rod, one fish. They're basically putting the rod in the water. The tuna are, are biting and they're flipping them over their, their heads. Incidentally, they practice with coconuts when they're younger so that they don't hit themselves in the head more than once. <laughs> now there's other bigger types of fish in the water. There's other tuna, but they can't fit on those hooks and they would break the rod. So the tuna that they're catching here are called skipjack tuna. They're only about five or eight kilos. They reproduce really quickly and they're very abundant. So the fishing lasts about as long as the bait and this ends up restricting what they're actually catching. So each boat can catch about 500 kilos to maximum one ton in a day. And this way, using the 
pole and line fishing technique, the Maldives can control the size and the species of fish that they harvest. And they have a very specific and measured effect on the wild stock. Now next, the catch is collected by other hunters on larger vessels. And they use these to transfer the fish to a processing plant. So as you can see, this is a very hands-on industry, and it creates a lot of jobs, not only for local people, but also for international workers who go to the Maldives to work in the fishing industry. Now, once the fish are on land in the Maldives, they go to a processing plant. There, the fish are cleaned, uh, they're cooked, and they're canned. And this is how every single can of tuna you've ever opened in your life has been made. All by hand. So because this is a very targeted technique, the Mar Maldives pole and line fishery is one of the most well-managed and stable fisheries in the world. Now, fish are not the only seafood that we hunt. Uh, about half of the seafood we eat these days comes from farms. And this is a black tiger shrimp farm in the Mekong River Delta in southern Vietnam. This is a traditional farming system where the tide delivers clean water and nutrients twice a day. So the farmers, there's one farming family who owns this farm. All that they really have to do is control the water in and out. Now, black tiger shrimp are native to this part of the world, and so the farmers don't have to feed the shrimp anything. They get all that they need from the nutrients in the water that is there naturally. They also don't use chemicals, and they don't use any antibiotics on the shrimp. So all they have to do is they go out on their little boat twice a month, they set their nets, and they catch shrimp. Now, in, in addition, these farms are integrated into a forest management plan. Uh, the farmers will plant mangrove trees, which provide more food and hiding places for the shrimp. As an extra bonus, uh, the trees help to mitigate the effects of climate change. And these are the beautiful creatures that come out of these farms. The shrimp, not the annoying kid. I mean. <laughs> um, this extensive, no-input way of farming black tiger shrimp not only has a low footprint, but it also ensures that the farmer has a decent income to support his family. So modern hunters have a vast amount of knowledge and technology at their disposal, but they also have an incredible effect on their prey. Currently, over a third of the world's fisheries are being hunted in an irresponsible way, and that number is increasing. Each of you outsources the hunting of 20 kilograms of fish and seafood per year. So we urban hunters, we may have outsourced our hunting, but we cannot outsource the responsibility. Now, as a responsible hunter, you should be concerned about the impacts you have on the last wild food and all other types of food. Now, to understand the impacts you have, use the amazing tools that humans have created. Above all, use the incredible tool that has made us such successful hunters. Use your brain. Ask questions. Ask questions like, what am I eating? What kind of fish is this? Where does it fit in the natural system? And how was it hunted? Where was it hunted? Was the outsourced hunter paid fairly for their work? To get the answers to these questions, all you have to do is read labels, learn about certifications, get on your phone and download a seafood app, which will help you make informed decisions the next time you go shopping. In short, hunt smarter. This way, humans like me, humans like you, and humans like our outsourced hunters will be able to continue hunting the last wild food. <laughs>